If you would, take your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. So actually, we're picking up where we left off last week. We'll see where the Lord leads through this. This isn't necessarily something I planned on being a series of any type. It's just one of those Old Testament stories that has so much application because God is in it and through it all, and you see God working in really the everyday, but also in the miraculous. And this, we started last week, really considering this idea or question, what do we do in times of drought? What do we do in times of drought when the dust is thick in our mouth, <clears throat> it's hard to breathe, life stinketh? What do you do in those times? Well, we saw Elijah, right? He got fed by some dirty birds and by an unknown widow in a foreign country. And yet through that all, we saw, what do we turn to? We turn to the word of the Lord. And that idea came up over and over and over again. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. God, even where you've led me, the brook dried up, right? And what was the response? Trust the word of the Lord. Trust the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Do the word of the Lord. That was repeated throughout. Well, as we come into this next part, it's really still the same story. The drought's still going on. The drought is still happening. <laughs> There's still no food. There's still famine in the land. People are starving. So we look that you look at the word of God. Today, though, we're going to focus in times of drought. The question comes up over and over again, who, who is your God? Who is your God? You say, well, my God's the God of the Bible, right? Well, we're really good at making our own little gods, aren't we? Sure, we don't, we don't go home maybe and uh, create little images, little golden images, and put them on the shelf and bow down to them. Or as we'll see in this passage, big golden images that look like cows and say, you're the God that brings me rain. But... We're really good at putting a lot of little gods in our life of this is where I'm going to run to, this is what I'm going to turn to, this is what I'm going to depend upon in times of drought. So the question, as we'll see throughout the end of chapter 17 and all through chapter 18, is who is God, who is your God? Because that question comes up over and over, and it really gets down at the character of God. Who are you going to trust? What does it take, just on a human level, what does it take for you to trust someone? Some of you, it looks like your visitors are new, and here I am standing up in a pulpit, and I have a Bible, and I have a tie on, but does that instantly make you trust me? Well, if you know the world today, it shouldn't, and rightfully so. Everyone that holds a Bible and wears a tie, that doesn't make them trustworthy, right? Purely external things. It's okay if you wear a suit and tie and American flag lapel and you have been duly elected <clears throat> to an office, then you trust that person, right? <laughs> Still not, huh? So it's not necessarily the office that makes you trust someone, right? What is it? It's their character. It's who they really are. <laughs> who you really know them to be. The day was December 19th. Big meeting, all the bigwigs. Talking about it, it was lively. It was animated, some back and forth, disagreement of ideas, but finally came to the conclusion. George left that meeting. He came out of it, turned to his crew around him, said these two words, play ball. Now, George, he wasn't a manager for the MLB or the Atlanta Braves. This was 1944, and George was a general in the Army. And he had just gotten out of meeting with President Eisenhower on how they were going to plan an attack that we now know as the Battle of the Bulge. Noted, really, as George Patton's 
greatest military, one of his greatest achievements through that. He came out and said, play ball, because why? What was the goal? What was the task ahead of them? Well, the stone, the, the city that the Germans had surrounded with American forces was under siege, under attack, and they had a break through enemy lines. Remember, this is December. There's snow, there's mud. All of that's going on. They had break through enemy lines and bring much needed supplies to the American forces that were trapped there. So if you're a soldier under the leadership and command of George Patton, what does it take for you to do your job? Well, you've already had your training, right? You've already had all the threats of whatever. But at this point, you're out there. You're over in Belgium. You're over in the middle of the Second World War. You don't get to go running home to mama, right? The only path forward is ahead, and here you have a man that we look at as a brilliant military leader, one with great confidence, a great military mind, forging the path ahead. And as your leader, you say, I'm going to follow this man because I know who he is and the plan and the direction that he has. So that's what they did. A few days later after that meeting, he has so many great quotes, but as they launched the attack, he said, the Krauts have their head in the meat grinder and I have my hand on the handle. He was ready to take them out, right? And he got three divisions together and recruited a few more and tons and tons of supplies. And the men set off through the mud and the snow and by December 26, just a few days later, they had reached the city of Bastogne and were able to give them much needed supplies, forged ahead, strong leadership. Because they knew their general, they knew their captain, they knew who to follow, they knew his steadfast character, and they knew the task at hand. Today in our passage, we're going to be looking at the true steadfast character of Almighty God who's not just a man that we follow because he's a great leader, but he is the perfect and holy and just creator of the entire universe who deserves our service and shows us the who and not the why. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to read through this story, and as we do, we're going to take each section and we're going to look at what it tells us about the character of who God is. So in each of the snippets of these stories, as we go through, we're going to look at who God is revealing himself to be. So in times of drought, who is your God? In times of drought, who is your God? We ended last time in verse 16 of, chapter, of 1 Kings 17, where it says, In the barrel of meal, this is 1 Kings 17, verse 16, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. What do we see here? That God has provided for Elijah through the raven. God has now provided through Elijah and, her, and, and this widow and her son through this unending flask of oil and, this, and flour. And so God is taking care of them, right? Still in the middle of the drought, but God is taking care of them. He's provided the food that they need. They can actually survive. Remember at the beginning of this, this time where we meet the widow, what was she ready to do? She told Elijah, I'm gathering sticks so I can go home and make a meal, make our, eat our one last meal, and then me and my son, we're going to sit down, and what are we going to do this evening? Dying. That's what our plan is. We're just going to die because we've given up hope. Now they have hope. They have food. Her son's not dead. He's alive. And then we come to verse 17. And what happened? And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. Oh no, now he's sick. But his sickness was so sore that there was no breath in him. What happened here? Wait, you saved my son. I was ready for him to die, but now we have food. Boom, right here again on the verge of death. Dying on the bed. So what does she do? Well, verse 18, she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O man of God? What is she saying? 
I thought you were taking care of me, right? And now everything's gone haywire again. thought you were doing good. So what do I have to do with you, O man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? What's she asking? She's asking why. Why is this happening to me? I thought you had just taken care of me and, and helped me and, and got me to a point so yeah, we can survive. And then boom, another thing hits, another big thing. Why are you doing this? Oh, okay, I know why. It's because of my sin, right? It's because of, I've messed up. Now God is judging me. Notice Elijah doesn't directly answer that. Other scriptures do, that God is merciful and gracious and forgives sin and doesn't hold us against us. But Elijah doesn't answer that part of the question for her, even though she's asking the why. Why is this happening to me? Why is my son dying? Elijah doesn't go there. What does he do and said? Verse 19, he said unto her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And what did Elijah do? He prayed. He prayed and he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? What did Elijah realize here? Well, he went to God first. He realized God in his providence and care, was the one who was over even these bad circumstances. They weren't out of God's sight. That God was the one that brought this evil or, or bad circumstance upon the widow. And he says, with whom I sojourn by slaying her son. Remember, we didn't talk about it much last week, but Elijah is actually in a foreign land. He, he's actually near the, near the place where Jezebel is from, outside of Israel. And so he's actually... God's goodness is spreading to those even outside of Israel, even though those outside of Israel have brought evil in. So he, he prays to God and sees that God is the one who brought this about. Verse 21, and he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. So the soul had already left. There was already death that had happened here. And notice the character of the Lord that shines through in these following verses. This simple truth. And the Lord heard. The Lord heard. That's a, that's a beautiful truth right there. Just those words. Because we're going to go on and see uh, the prophets of Baal. <laughs> that their God didn't hear. But here we see that the true God. The living God. He hears. And he heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came in again, and he revived. God listened to Elijah and granted his request. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him into his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. What did she learn from this? Did she get the why answered here? Did she, did she get the why of why her son experienced this or why she had to go through this? Not really. But what did she come away with? She came away with who. Who God is and who his prophet is. She came away with the truth of God and that God is a living God. So what do we see about God even in this first section? That God is a living God and true God, he has the power to raise the dead, and he wants you to know who he is. Not necessarily all the whys. Do you have any stink in your life? Do you have any messed up circumstances? We talked a little bit, Pastor Jeff did a couple weeks ago, about the why. It's so we can comfort others. But remember Job? We have this whole book we get a scene to heaven's courtroom or scene, the, the scene of heaven, but Job knows nothing of that. Satan coming, God allowing Satan, God giving permission to Satan to do all of these horrible things to Job. And Job having to go through all of that, 
Job wanting to defend his, his righteousness before God and saying, only if I could appeal it before God. And how does God answer him? You remember the end of the book? God just gives an awesome display of his glory and says, Job, who made this? Who made, you know, these huge, ferocious beasts? Who made the world? Who, who, who? <laughs> Not the why, why, why. In other words, it comes back to you trust the character of a God who is living and a God who is true. And that God who is living and true is powerful enough to raise the dead. That's the kind of great, powerful God that we serve. So that's what we see from this first section, a true and a living God. What about the next section? Well, we turn the chapter to chapter 18. And we see a powerful and providential God, one who directs even in the everyday circumstances of life. Time passes, and it came to pass, chapter 18, verse 1, after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. This has been going on for years now. So this, this time, how long he was at the brook, we don't know, but with the widow, several years it seems like, and now finally, He's, God comes and says, go show yourself to Ahab. Wait a minute. If you're Elijah, is this a good plan? So we've already brought drought upon the earth, right? But, you know, God has brought that upon by the word of Elijah, really by the word of the Lord. And it's just kind of been for several years now a holding pattern. Elijah is not in Israel. He's over in Zidon or Zion, you know, away outside of Israel with this widow you say, wait a minute, the prophet of God, he's out of action, it seems like, for a couple years. Not doing really anything except eating <laughs> the oil and flour, right? And so there's this time of waiting, but all of that, though, is under God's care and direction. Because here now, finally, God's word comes and says, go, go to Ahab, the king, the king that hates your guts, and go show yourself and then God says, and I will send rain upon the earth. So what does Elijah do? He obeys. Because he knows the character of God. He went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. What does that mean? It means they were so hungry it hurt, right? It was bad. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house, now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So what's happening here? There's a period where Elijah, the big head prophet, he's not seen. We don't hear from him, it seems like, for a couple years. And yet here's Obadiah, who's working right under wicked King Ahab, right under his nose, and what's Obadiah doing? In the midst of God's providence, he's able to secure and rescue and then hide prophets, prophets of God. And even though he's conversing with the king himself, he's actually doing God's will and bidding, not the king that's directly over him. Verse 5, And Obadiah, or Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water, and to unto all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Goes one way and then the other. What do we see from each part of this section? We see a powerful and providential God that he's directing in creation and in the lives of his people, and even those who are not his people. What's the idea here? God's in control. That's his character, and he's directing even the most mundane things to going and looking for water, which is a natural thing to do in a drought. We've got to go find any little source of water that we can because everything has dried up, and we're going to lose all of our livestock if we don't find water. So Ahab goes one way, and he sends his man Obadiah the other way, and who's Obadiah? He's the one that's already saved all these prophets of the Lord. All of this is happening in a time of famine, a drought, and where Elijah is not on the scene, and yet God is still at work. 
God is still powerful. What does this teach us? You have times not of just drought, but of kind of just hovering in the same place for a while. Lord, I, I want to know what to do next, where to go next, how are you going to solve this problem next. Lord, I want to know the what. I want to know the what. What's going to happen? And again, it comes back to this idea. God says, no, I want you to know the who. I want you to know that I'm powerful and I'm working. Even in times where it doesn't seem like I'm working, I'm still caring for my people. I'm still taking care of them. Even though it doesn't look like much progress is being made, right? All of the prophets are hiding in the cave. What good is that? They're not helping the people, right? Elijah's in a different country. What good is that? And yet this is all in God's providence, all in God's plan. God is a powerful and providential God. Then we turn to the next section, which focuses on Obadiah and Elijah specifically. So Ahab and Obadiah, they split off. Obadiah goes one way, and verse 7 says, As Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? Notice how he addresses him, because later on, he's going to use the word lord again in reference to Ahab. But that's just saying, Ahab's over me, but you're really who I want to follow, is the idea here. I really want to go after you. The name Obadiah even displays that too because the name Obadiah simply means servant of Jehovah or servant of the Lord. Obadiah is here in the midst of a wicked, corrupt king right under his leadership as a servant of the Lord doing the Lord's work. And here he finally sees Elijah, verse 8, and he answered him, Elijah did, and said, I am, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. So what's the thing? Obadiah, you're, the, you're Ahab's second command. Go tell Ahab, Ahab that I'm here. So what would Obadiah's response be? Well, it's interesting again. He asks the same question that the widow asks. Verse 9, he says, What have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? He's like, what are you doing, man? Ahab hates your guts, and you want me to tell him that you're here. And Obadiah's like, I know how this works. I've seen this happen before. And in the following verses, he says, I'm going to go tell Ahab that you're here, and then the Spirit of the Lord is going to take you, Elijah, and whisk you away, and we're going to come back, and you're not going to be standing here, and Ahab's going to look at me and say, where's Elijah? And I'm going to say, he was right here. And he says, well, he's not right here. And then Ahab's going to kill me. So I don't really like this plan. And that's what he goes through. Look at verse 10. The Lord liveth. There is no nation or kingdom whether my Lord has not sent to seek thee. We've looked everywhere for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. What, what, was, what was happening? Ahab sent out people everywhere, spies everywhere, saying, find this guy Elijah. Find out where he is. Get him. Of course, Elijah's really, what is he doing? He's hiding in the widow's house. Who would look there? Yeah. And every time a report would come back, the, the messenger would come in and Ahab would say, have you found him yet? And they would say, no, we don't know where he is. And he's like, swear to me. Swear to me on the nation that you serve. You took an oath to this nation. Are you telling me the truth? So this is under threat and penalty of even death that Ahab was so intent on finding Elijah because he wanted to kill him that he was doing this to all of the people. Verse 11 and Obadiah continues, And now that sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he will slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Elijah, I'm on your side. <laughs> Don't mess it up for me, please. Verse 13, Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Elijah, I'm on your side. I'm helping the prophets right under Jezebel and Ahab's noses. Verse 14, And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah says, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab, and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. 
What do we see even from this passage? Well, Obadiah and Elijah, on the same team, not quite understanding each other, wanting to advance the work of the Lord, but having a lot of trouble doing it. Both have been in hiding, in a way, both hiding people and in hiding, literally. And through all of that, sometimes we think that's how God is. In other words, when when bad things happen and it seems that God is quiet, it seems that he is hiding too. In other words, God, why aren't you doing anything about anything? But notice the name of the Lord in verse 15. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord over everything. He's a real God. He's really real is the idea. Because he's really big and he's really great. He's overall. And he's also a present God. He's real and present. What do I mean by that? Elijah here is saying, I'm going to show myself. Why would Elijah show himself? Really to show God's self too. It seems like God has been silent, but now's the time for God to speak. And this whole time God has been real, and this whole time God has been present, and God has actually been protecting what seemed to be a lull or a time where the prophets were just sitting. What was God doing? He was protecting his men. He was protecting the prophets in the cave. He was protecting Elijah in the widow's house. God is still real and active and present. He's showing himself faithful to his servant, Obadiah, servant of Yahweh. So what have we seen so far? In these three snippets, we've seen we have a a true and living God. He can raise the dead. We have a power and providential God. He directs his creation and people We have a real and present God. He shows himself to be faithful even when it's really hard to see. We go on and we see verse 17 and following that we have a just and right God. All this wickedness is happening. Does God care about this wickedness? Notice verse 17 of chapter 18. It says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Elijah, you done messed up. You're troubling. You're the problem, Elijah. You're doing God's will. You're the problem. You think that will get said to you, or has that been said to you? I'm just trying to do what's right. And someone says, you're the problem. You're doing what's wrong. You're the one that troubleth it. The same word, troubleth, was the same word used when Achan went into Jericho, stole some of the things he should not have, hid it in his tent, and all of Israel was, what happened? Troubled. Remember Ai? Big defeat there. They were troubled. So what's Ahab saying? Elijah, it's all your fault. How would you handle that? Wait, I'm doing God's will. I'm God's servant. I'm I'm trying to do what's right. It's all your fault that this trouble is happening. But Elijah boldly answers verse 18, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. What's Elijah boldly pointing out? Ahab, your sin. Your sin's the problem. Your sin of forsaking God and turning to whatever idol you think is actually going to satisfy and fulfill. And your idol stinks because it's supposedly the God of rain and you haven't gotten any rain for three years. You need to upgrade your God. You need to get a better one. But you've forsaken the one true God, the one that really controls everything. And he's not going to overlook your sin. He's not going to overlook your wrongdoing. And to prove that, this is what Elijah prom- or suggests in verse 19. He says, Now therefore send and gather me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400, would eat at Jezebel's table. God is a just and right God. He doesn't overlook sin. And for us today, the same is still true. That's the character of God. Now you may be saying, Pastor Phil, does God send judgment on America or on me because of my sin or because of our sin? 
And I can't point and say for certainty that this and this and this happened because of sin, but we do know that God uses all things, even the wicked things and bad things and even horrible things, to get people's attention, right? At the same time, we know that God is gracious and forgiving too. God is, can be a just and right God and still deal with your sin in a just and right way where you don't have to suffer the eternal consequences. That's the beauty of the gospel, is it not? That all sin, it's going to be taken care of. God is just and right. He's going to take care of it, every sin. And he gives the choice to us on how that's going to be taken care of. It's either eternal punishment and what Jesus calls a lake of fire because one sin against an infinite and holy God deserves infinite punishment or it's all going to be under the blood of Jesus which God says is just and right he poured out his wrath on Jesus Jesus took our place so that we wouldn't have to suffer that but it still shows us that our God is a just and right God he's not going to overlook man's sin so are you behind Jesus? Are you under the blood is the question even here. Or are you distressed about everyone else's sin? Sometimes you can't really do a thing about it, right? Except trust the just and right God to take care of it. So we've seen that who is the char- what is the character of God? He's living, he's true. He's powerful, he's providential. He's real, he's present, he's just, he's right. And then we'll see in this instant of the prophets of Baal versus Elijah that God is faithful and dependable. In other words, you could say it this way. God is who he is regardless of your opinion. God is who he is regardless of of your opinion. Look at verse 20. This is where this duel is set up between Elijah and 850 prophets of Baal. 450 plus the 400 others. Verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, that is the people of Israel, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? What is he saying? You're double-minded like James says. You're trying to hold on to two things at once. You're trying to hold on to your your idol and God. How long are you going to halt? The idea is limp back and forth between these two ideas. You're swinging back and forth. It's not working out very well for you, is it? You say Yahweh or Jehovah is your God, and yet you're going back to this golden calf, this golden bowl of Baal. How long are you going to stumble between these two opinions? Make up your mind on who your God really is. Because God is going to be God, whether you think he is or not. So it's best that you follow him. Notice what he continues in verse 21. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. What is he saying? Base it on the character of who God is is if he's really god that's who he is follow him if baal your made-up god is really god his character will show it follow him what do the people do they answered him not a word they were speechless in a way they're like yeah you're right it's that it's that speechlessness when you know someone's right but you don't really have a response because you know you're in the wrong And so Elijah says, let's prove this. Let's prove who is the faithful and dependable God, who the true God really is. Verse 22, Elijah said unto the people, I, even I, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. The odds don't look good from a human perspective, right? One good guy versus 450 bad guys. The other good prophets are still hiding in the cave. Verse 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks, And let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut into pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. I love how they're using a bull, which was the symbol of Baal in their mind, and yet they're killing the bull to sacrifice it to their gods. 
And ye call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth it by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Notice the end of verse 24, what Elijah is really calling us to do. Notice he uses the word follow him in verse 21. Verse 24, what is he saying? Let him be God. Applying that in our own lives can be really hard. Why is that? Because we've got a, little, a lot of little idols on the shelves that we really like, right? Maybe it's the idol of worry <laughs> or whatever we reach for of, of uh, material things are going to, you know, take care of me as they were doing here. Or and There's so many other little idols we could put in the place of God whether it's our own fleshly desires or our own insecurities or who we think God should be. And what is Elijah calling these people to? What is he calling us to? He's saying, let God be God. He's already God. Let him be God in your life. You have to choose. So the people said it is well spoken, verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose one bullock for yourself and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. So nice. He let them go first. He let them have pick of which bullock. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. What does this look like? What does it look like when you or I serve a false god? It looks a little crazy, doesn't it? In other words, how, how stupid or crazy did these people look? They're crying out all morning long, crying, crying, God answer us. Our God answer us. Baal, send down fire. Nothing. Now I know what we need to do. We need to start jumping on the altar. That's going to do it, right? Let's get up here and start jumping around. Maybe he, he didn't see us. Need to make some more action. Does not the world without God often look so crazy? But are not our own hearts tempted to do the same at times? The God who is shows himself and shows his character and yet so often in our own sin, we choose to say, eh, no, that's not really who God is. And we go do our own thing. And how crazy and how stupid do we really look? Verse 27. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. I love this. This is a good Twitter back and forth feed, right? This is fun to read. Popcorn's in the comments right here. Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. <laughs> maybe you're a god. Yeah, maybe he's just not home right now. You tried texting him. Uh, maybe he's sleeping. You need to just, you know, yell a little louder. <laughs> he's just mocking them. And what did they do? They took the bait. Look at verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves out of the manor with knives and lancets, and blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regardeth. What is a false god? It's one that makes you do crazy stuff. It's one that makes you go to extremes. They're not just leaping on the altar anymore. What are they doing? They're cutting themselves with knives. What are they trying to show? Total dedication. I'm giving even of my blood. I'm spilling my own blood to hopefully get this false god. Do not people just pour their life and everything they have into something that is so temporary and meaningless? And God calls us to something much greater and much bigger Set your minds on things above. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. 
And yet, <laughs> this is what the world's doing. And notice they did it all day long. It was all the way into the evening that they're crying out. These men, they must have been hoarse, tired, dizzy with the loss of blood, delirious, all of these things all day trying to get their false god to do something. Nothing happens. Why? Their god's not real. God has no character. But who is our God? Our God is who he is regardless of anyone's opinion. He's a faithful and dependable God. Look at verse 30. Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. This was obviously a place that sacrifices to the Lord had been made before but was in disarray because of non-use. Reminds me of this baptistry back here. Pastor Jeff has a pet peeve, and I love it, that decorations or anything should not be stored in the baptistry. And why is that? Because that's not what a baptistry is for, right? It's for baptizing people. It's hard to baptize people when you have chairs and flowers and music stands in there. What's that purpose? Its purpose is to baptize, and we want to see, and we have more planned Soon, I know there are several that are wanting to be baptized, and that's a good and a joyous thing because we want that thing to be used. Well, here, the altar had been filled up with all the things of life, and it wasn't being used in worship to God. And so what did Elijah do? He repaired the altar. And he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And he built... With stones he built the altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seeds. In other words, a lot, a lot of water. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and in the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't need any magic tricks. I don't need any secret fire in there. You can douse that. You can douse it good. You can fill lots of water. What is this on Elijah's part? It's really faith. It's trust. Elijah knows, in other words, who God is, regardless of the people's opinions. What's Elijah showing by his action here? God is who God says he is, regardless of what anyone else says, and I know it. I'm going to bank it off of bathtubs full of water on my sacrifice that's supposed to burn. So we've seen a faithful, dependable God. And as we close, we see a great and glorious God. He displays his character and his might. Here Elijah prays, And it came to pass after the time of offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. God, I know who you are. I know what you've commanded. I followed you. Lord, I know it's in your hands. So hear me, O Lord. Hear me that these people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And what happened? Here's the prayer. God, show your glory so that people will see it. God, I want people to see who you are so that their hearts, you will turn them to you and that you will be God in their minds and lives. And what has happened? Verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifices and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. There was no question this is a miraculous act of God. He's going to burn everything, including the water. I don't know what it takes to burn water, but I think it's a lot. Okay? I've never been able to do it. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook, brook Kishon and slew them there. The great and glorious God 
displays his character and might. God shows, I am the true God. I am the only one. I am the one that is great and glorious. And then this chapter ends with God finally sending rain again, showing that he's the creator and the controller of all things. Elijah said unto Ahab, verse 41, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said unto his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and rain, and there was a great rain, years of drought, rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel, where Jezebel is. What is this showing? God, ultimately, we started with drought. The drought finally comes to the end, and who's the one that brings it to the end? It's God. It's the one who controls all, the one who is creator over all. My clock says it's 105, so thanks for staying an hour late. <laughs> who is your God? God is who he's revealed himself to be. That's his character. He's the living and true God, power to raise the dead. He's a providential and powerful God. He directs in his creation and people. He's a real and present God. He shows himself faithful. He's a just and right God. He doesn't overlook sin. He's a faithful and dependable God. He is who he is regardless of your opinion. He's a great and glorious God. He displays his character and might. Remember the works of the Lord. And our God is the creator and controller of all things. That's who God is. So what do you do in times of drought? Look at the who. Look at the who. Go to the who. Go to the God that is.